So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for this two-week virtual ASNIC nuclear cardiology elective. Today, we have another phenomenal speaker with us, uh, Dr. Moaz Almala. He is the director of cardiovascular PET from Houston Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center and the Houston Methodist Hospital. Thank you very much, Moaz, for joining today. Now the screen is all yours. All right, thank you, Sharmila. And I wanna thank Sharmila for taking the initiative to put um, this course uh, together in a short time. And I understand a lot of fellows are enjoying it. And hopefully we will continue to impress you with what uh, ASNIC has to offer. I forgot to put in the plugin slides for ASNIC, but I just wanna remind everyone that ASNIC offers free membership to fellows and it's important and you're more than welcome to join ASNIC uh, membership. This will give you access to a lot of educational activities, but also allow you to uh, be on uh, get learning uh, and educational activities and get access to a lot of useful information. And there are also some training opportunities. Uh, there is the leadership development program, which many of us have been involved in, and uh, uh, it will get you into being involved with the society and learn from other phenomenal colleagues across the uh, globe and country. Um, I think at this time, I'm going to start today, we're tasked to, over the coming couple of hours, we're tasked to share with you information about high-risk features, both on SPECT and PET, but also at the same time, we're going to share a lot of cases that SPECT, PET, hybrid imaging, CT, and others. So you will see a lot of multimodality imaging, a little bit about myself. I had the honor of training with Dr. DeCarli and uh, Dr. Uh, Durbala many years ago in the Brigham, and I learned it all from them. We were the first batch of the multimodality imaging fellows there. So we, as I do nuclear cardiology, but I also do CT and MRI, and this will give us a good, um, um, good uh, ability good uh, ability to allow for uh, everyone to be able to uh, provide the best test for the patient. Today, in the coming couple hours, I'll be joined by a couple phenomenal colleagues uh, the team that will be joining me will be Dr. Nabi, who's an associate professor and has published a lot in terms of coronary uh, nuclear cardiology and uh, calcium scoring. Dr. Rusha Perik, she's also online and she's our chief cardiac imaging fellow, and she'll be monitoring the chat box along with Dr. Carlos Satilawi, who's one of our imaging fellows and he'll be sharing a case as well as Dr. Sharon Kalef, who's also an imaging fellow, and she'll be sharing a case with you. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and look at the topic, which is primarily high-risk features. So in the coming um, few minutes, we're gonna focus on what are the high risk features that we need to care about? And remember when we are doing perfusion imaging, both SPECT and PET, this is a stress test in addition to imaging. So we cannot interpret just one of them without looking at the other one. We need to learn these parameters and look at them in together because there are certain times that they are in agreement and that's great, but there are other times where they could be in disagreement and that will have some potential implications for patient care as you see here. So the, yesterday there was a, uh, Dr. Scali gave an excellent uh, talk about the emergencies and the, some of the stress parameters you need to keep an eye on. 
but some of them I just want to emphasize them because they are extremely important while looking at uh, interpretation. The first one is obviously exercise duration. And as you know, the longer the exercise capacity and the longer the patient can exercise, the better is the exercise capacity, is the, the lower the event rate over time. This has been shown in a few small samples. But also, has we showed that in a large sample size where there are many patients who actually will look at it in 70,000 patients. And you can see on all prognostic studies, the ability of the patient to exercise and the ability to achieve the length of the exercise is always the strongest predictor of outcome. So this is a very important uh, data point that you need to take into consideration when you are looking at patient at the prognostic value and the high risk features in these patients. Also, there are other parameters that you look at, which is the chronotropic index or the ability to, uh, to achieve 85% of uh, heart rate. So among patients who do not achieve the 85, the among patients so among patients who do not achieve the 85% exercise cap, uh, heart rate, they are at a higher risk also, and they will have the uh, they will have higher risk of uh, events. There are also the Duke Treadmill score that you can calculate for many of these patients. And you can calculate uh, Duke treadmill score by calculating a duration in exercise minus five times a C-segment deviation in millimeters and four times the uh, angina index. And it can come up into numbers. If it is plus five or greater, that's low risk. Intermediate risk is minus 10 to plus four. And the high risk is less than minus 10. And you can see that this independently have uh, in the, have um, independent prognostic value there. But in this slide, because I don't want to go on repeating everything that Hisham yesterday nicely demonstrated, I put in a slide that summarizes all the high risk features that you need to keep in mind when you are interpreting the excess, the uh, stress portion of the stress test to determine if this is a high risk or not. The first one is the duration of symptom uh, limiting exercise if the patient did not exercise, did not achieve six months. If these patients did not increase their blood pressure as you well saw yesterday, Obviously, if there are ST depressions, especially if they are more than two millimeter down sloping, if they happen into rec in recovery also, if there is obviously exercise induced ST segment elevation, that's considered the high risk. Angina at low workload, that is a poor sign. If the patient developed ST uh, sustained VT or uh, more than uh, 30 seconds, if there is poor heart rate recovery and chronotropic incompetence, all of these are associated with uh, poor outcome, even in the presence of a normal perfusion. Now, one thing I want to highlight also is looking at EKG changes among patients who are undergoing adenosine stress or vasodilator stress. Even in the presence of normal MPI, this is associated with increased worsening outcome in these patients. So the presence of a positive EKG should alert you that there might be disease even in the presence of normal perfusion. And in these patients, most often we recommend further testing and that could be depending on the symptoms and pretest likelihood, it could go anywhere from referral to coronary angiography to potentially doing other testing like coronary CT and geography. Now, moving on to the imaging part, 
and this is what we are trying to identify from the imaging part, are those patients who have severely abnormal studies that will have high risk features. And this was studied by Dr. Hakomovich using the CEDAR data. And what you can see here is that one of the main aspects is obviously the perfusion, the presence of a perfusion defect. So if the patient has a large perfusion defect, obviously that's considered the high risk pattern. And Dr. Durbala went on the first day how we determine the size, the location, the severity, and the reversibility of the perfusion defect and how we score them across different, um, different aspects. But it's not only the defect that is predicting outcome. We have more aspects that we look at. So defect extent, severity, reversibility, that's all important. But we need to look at other features like increased pulmonary radiotracer uptake. This is probably less now seen in the days of technetium, but more important with thallium. Now we continue to see transient dilatation of the LB post stress. If there is increased right ventricular uptake for stress, if there is drop in ejection fraction after stress, this is probably more important in PET where we are using uh, the same dose and we're imaging the patient during stress rather than after stress. With SPECT, yesterday there was some discussion or the day before about whether the true drop in EF may be uh, true versus not accurate given the changes in the doses of between stress and rest and same day protocol. Obviously, if the patient has high calcium score, they will have worse long-term outcome, but in the presence of the deep perfusion defect, that is probably make it higher risk than those. And next week, you're gonna hear from Dr. DiCarli about coronary flow reserve and how we use it to um, predict outcomes in these patients and achieve higher diagnostic accuracy. So this is the data from Dr. Hakomovich looking at the scan result and the outcome. Uh, what you can see here that as the defect actually worsens, sorry, the slide is not projecting well. These are the normal ones. These are the severely abnormal. As you see here, the severely abnormal have much higher rate of cardiac death or myocardial infarction compared to those who are in the normal range. This is a slide that you're gonna hear, see a lot and hear a lot because we are using this percent of myocardial ischemia to go ahead and determine who would potentially benefit from devascularization using the same test. You can see that among patients who have small area of ischemia, revascularization is not going, devascularization is not going to impact on uh, outcomes of these patients. In fact, they may get the one, not the benefit of revascularization, but potentially the complications. However, at least in this registry data, it appears that patients who have uh, medical therapy do worse compared to those who revascularization, and this is potentially in all comers. Also, patients looking at thallium, those who had positive thallium and lung uptake had higher cardiac death or myocardial infarction compared to those who had normal thallium or positive thallium but no lung uptake. And this is primarily because these patients now will have during exercise, there is increase in their LVADP. These patients will have higher transit time in the lung, and then these patients will potentially have worsening outcome, sorry, will have um, higher time for uptake of the thallium in the lung. TID, it's uh, also well seen here, and you can see that it may represent, it can be, it's a dilatation of the stress image and this can be seen the cavity appears dilated this is what you see for example in this patient where it could be due to subendocardial diffuse subendocardial ischemia 
but it could also be has been described in the absence of obstructive disease among patients with significant left ventricular hypertrophy and also among patients with significant valvular heart disease and other and others but in the presence uh, in the absence of normal sorry in the presence of normal perfusion these patients have worse outcome compared to those who had lower uh, who had less than TI, less TID. And if you ask me what is the ratio we are using, this has been like widely debated in the literature depending on the pro uh, protocol you're using and what type of isotope, but kind of most people are using a 1.2 cutoff to call TID. Obviously, there is nothing magic between 1.19 and 1.2. So it's like more of a graded response, but if you're gonna draw a cutoff to call it, then it's around the 1.2. Uh, ejection fraction is very important. And you can see here as the ejection fraction drops, we see worse outcome in this patient, but it's not only ejection fraction, it's also the volume. So the ancestolic volume when the LV dilate compared to those who do not dilate actually do worse. So at every ejection fraction, the dilated LV is also worse in terms of outcome compared to those who do not dilate. So LV size and function are important and are high risk features that we can detect. So if we take a pause here and try to decide whether these patients do worse if they undergo a exercise versus pharmacologic stress. Does it really matter in risk prediction? Well, in terms of diagnostic accuracy, we probably have similar sensitivity, a little bit more specificity with vasodilator stress, especially with adenosine. This is a little bit old data, even from uh, Dr. Mamerian and Verani. But when we look at the outcomes, as we said in the beginning, the ability to exercise in itself is a good prognostic sign. So among those who have severely abnormal studies, the event rate is gonna be much lower because the patient is a relatively lower risk and this patient can exercise compared to those pharmacologic stress. So normally what we say that the event rate of a normal study is less than 1% per year, but you can see this does not apply to pharmacologic stress because these patients actually have um, an event rate of one point, um, more than 1% even in the setting of normal study. So I know that some of you are putting questions and as soon as I'm done with the lecture, we'll go ahead and Carlos is uh, tracking them down now and we'll go ahead and answer them toward the end. So he's gonna pull them. So keep the questions coming and we will answer them as soon as we are done with the lecture. So we can keep going now and then we can cover them. So, as I mentioned, the normal MPI has usually a less than 1% annual event rate, but among those patients, this does not apply to multiple other groups. So this is mainly those who exercise and have a normal study. But if the patient did not achieve this target heart rate, we may be underestimating ischemia because the patient did not reach a level where it could be showing the ischemia. Among those patients with pharmacologic stress, I just showed you the data. And among patients with advanced age, so obviously if you have a normal study in a 95-year-old patient, the event rate is not going to be 1% per, 1 per year. Patients with diabetes, and I'll show you the data after this, patients with non-coronary disease, patients with high Duke treadmill score, even in the setting of normal LV, those with transient ischemic dilatation of the LV and those with renal failure. Their event rate, even in the setting of normal study, is not 1%. It's much higher than that. This is the diabetic data. So the lesson, the no diabetes, 
the event rate is 0.8, but those who are diabetics, even when they are normal, they are having a higher risk, higher risk of event. And what you can see is that myocardial perfusion imaging can differentiate a lower risk diabetic from a higher risk diabetic by the presence of perfusion defect. But at every stage, those patients with diabetes will have worse event rate compared to those who are uh, non-diabetic. And here is, this is shown in this plot. So you can here look at the sum stress score that Dr. Drabala mentioned how we calculate it in the beginning. And here's the hazard ratio. At every stage, a non-diabetic will have lower risk compared to a non-insulin dependent, compared to an insulin dependent patient who is gonna have the highest risk. Similarly, we published working when I was working with Dr. Durbala and Dr. DiCarli. We, sim we have similar things, but here we're looking at all-cause mortality among renal failure. So those renal failure patients, if they have a normal study, their event rate is not 1%, and this is all-cause mortality. But at every stage, you can see here, the abnormal will have worse outcome as their risk increase. And we show very similar curves here across the different GFRs. So at every GFR, so let's say there is 30% ischemia, the, the risk of the at 75 GFR is gonna be much lower compared to the risk of a 25 GFR. So these patients are gonna have, are gonna have worse outcome if they have low GFR. So this is for spec data. I think to sum it up, I wanna show you one case and we'll probably go with some polling like we were doing yesterday in the chat box. So this is a patient that I've seen, 65 year old male, referred for chest pain. He's got type one diabetes for 40 years, hyperlipidemia, hypertension and erectile dysfunction. And you know where I'm going with all of these. He went on the treadmill. The guy is a CEO and he is doing fine, but he's been having some chest discomfort. So he went on the treadmill. This is his baseline EKG, and I'm sure you all agree that there are no baseline abnormalities that we see to be suspicious for ischemia. He did exercise, and this is at peak exercise. He achieved like about seven or eight minutes, you can now see that this patient has significant ST depressions, AVR elevation. I know that many of you yesterday were pointing out that and its value there. But when we looked at the images, you can clearly see that these are his perfusion images. And now the questions for you that I have, and I would like you to put in one, two, or three, or four, what would you do? Medical management, he had no chest pain on treadmill, no drop in ejection fraction. Would you do a stress echo? You do coronary CT or cardiac catheterization? And doctor, and I have Carlos looking at the numbers. It looks like everybody, we have mostly cardiac catheterization, but coronary CT. Some coronary CT, some cardiac catheterization. So in this patient, he was not too keen on having a cardiac catheterization because he didn't want to uh, go for an invasive procedure and he underwent a coronary CT angiography. 40 years of diabetes, look how nice his right coronary there. This is done on a 64 slice, so there is some motion there. You can see here another plaque in the left main, but it's not obstructive and you can see the circ very well. But then when we go to the LED, you can see multiple, this is the left main, and this is another densely calcified plaque. And once we go ahead and look at it in cross sections and curved NPRs, now we start to see this is at this point. This is another one at this point where I barely see any lumen. And this is at another point. So this is the patient who had a very positive EKG. I have no explanation why I couldn't pick it up on nuclear, but you can clearly see that this patient actually had uh, uh, 
clearly a lesion in there. So the positive EKG in disagreement with the myocardial perfusion imaging, you should seek further testing to clarify that. And that's considered as calcium score is nearly 739 in this patient. Another patient that I want to share also is another 74 year old man, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, obesity, borderline diabetes, former smoker. Came in for chest pain for almost a year now bothering him, but it's kind of atypical and once he developed the pain, he stopped exercising, the pain go away, and he's not getting pain at rest. He exercised on the treadmill only for three minutes, and this is where uh, some of the variables I've been mentioning. Stage one protocol. He's deconditioned, so he achieved his target heart rate, 85%. His double product is 20,000 or so. Normal EKG response, and he got the same chest pain that he got before. And now we have this perfusion imaging. So take a second to look at it. This is a male. LV function was normal, normal warm motion, normal contraction. And these are supine images. Now the question to you is, so let's go A, B, C, D. This test is low risk, B is intermediate, C is high, and cannot tell. So I'm getting B, C. So this patient, obviously, I mean, by Duke treadmill score, he's in the intermediate risk. By imaging, there is probably a small defect in here that you see, but this is most likely attenuation and there was normal contraction. So this is more likely diaphragmatic attenuation. And this is where we were not satisfied with this patient only exercising for three minutes. So we added, like we do in many patients, we added the calcium score. And now you have rocks in his LED, rock in the circ, another rock in the um, circ and the RCA, and this is his total calcium score. 1741, it's in all three vessels, least in the RCA, but mostly in the LED. And this is a patient who obviously have three vessel disease, and the reason we didn't see the ischemia because he didn't go that far. He only exercised three minutes. And this is something very important when you are supervising in the nuclear lab. You want the patient not to stop just because they achieved their target heart rate. They could achieve it in one minute or two minutes if they are deconditioned. And what you want them is to go ahead as far as it's a symptom limited test. So you want them to go as far as they can so you can try to elicit ischemia and not underestimate the degree of ischemia that we see in here. So I'm gonna finalize, finish here by looking at cardiac PET at this time and see what are the high risk features that we get. Now in cardiac PET, there are some differentiations between what we get and SPECT versus PET. We get relative perfusion, but we also get absolute perfusion, and we get CFR, and you've seen some cases yesterday. Because these are PET-CT machines, most of the time we are doing a calcium score with these patients. It's much easier, can be done quickly, and at least you have a CT attenuation correction to look for coronary calcification. And also we have a gating at peak stress rather than one hour or so after. So Dr. Durbala showed us that the same thing applies in terms of percent ischemia. So we know that the more ischemic or perfusion defect that we see, the higher the event rate. This is very similar to what we see in SPECT. This is more specific because now we our images are less prone to attack to our artifacts and we should be more aware of it. But what we know also, and this was alluded to in the coming, in the past couple of days, 
that if you see a drop of 5% or more in the ejection fraction, that is very worrisome from a diagnostic standpoint because it could be left main or three vessel disease. Now, obviously you have to make sure that this is not a technical drop, technical issue, not PVCs, not contouring issues. These are very important to roll out. And this drop also has worse outcomes. So if there is drop in ejection fraction, it has worse event rate. But with PET, we are also able to get some data on myocardial perfusion and reserve. And for those of you who don't have exposure to PET, what we are doing is that we're tracking the rubidium or ammonia as it's passing through the right ventricle and then going through the left ventricle. And now we have the ability to measure the absolute flow and come up with a ratio of the stress and stress, how much blood made it into the myocardium. And this in itself as incremental prognostic value, and this has been shown in multiple studies, it adds incremental prognostic value over our ischemia assessment that we know from perfusion defect and ejection fraction. Recently, Dr. Bateman and his group from Mid-America, and you're gonna hear from him next week, published on nearly 12,500 patients. And they showed also that the drop in myocardial flow reserve actually is associated with worse outcome. And this has been shown in patients with no ischemia, as well as in those who have higher ischemia. So it's another high prognostic variable to keep in mind when you're looking at these patients. And it may have the potential to guide therapy in these patients across a myocardial flow reserve of potentially 1.8. These patients on this side of the curve, those with lower uh, CFR may benefit from revascularization while the others may not have as much benefit as we see here. So I think at this point, after showing you the stress and rest variables from both SPECT and PET, we're gonna take a pause and answer some of your questions. And then we will go ahead and uh, move on. So what do you consider a significant drop in ejection fraction? That is according to the study that we just showed you, uh, again, you have to ensure that this is true drop in ejection fraction and not a technical issue. We are using a 5% in there. Sometimes you see 1% to 2%. Ideally, the left ventricle should augment with vasodilation, especially now that we are using most rigadenosone. With rigadenosone, the heart rate is going to go up. So you're going to see some improvement in LV function. So the lack of improvement is worrisome, but the drop is even worse. But again, the most common thing that is caught as the reason for that is actually the, uh, is actually the, uh, the, the most common cause is a technical issue and this is what you need to be careful for. Is there any cutoff for co or concerning for obstructive CAD? No, so we will go through some cases where patients have very high calcium score and they have no obstructive disease and some mm -hmm. patients with low calcium score and have obstructive disease. So, but if you take everybody with high calcium score, this it's increases in chance. So technically the higher likelihood of coronary disease increases as the calcium score increases. So 1.2 for pharmacological and exercise. So in the literature, there are some other numbers people have used for TID, which is looking at 1.2 versus 1.35, but technically to simplify things, and again, there is nothing magic about 20% versus 25% uh, or like 15%. So something to keep in mind. I know we like to think of cutoffs, 
but it is more of a linear relationship rather than um, rather than a true relationship uh, cutoff. So it's not like the patient will not have any event if it is 1.18, and then they will have a much higher risk if it is 1.120. Now, there are some questions about drop in ejection fraction. Again, we answered that based on the slide that you see, the question that you see on the slide here. And what cutoff value of ejection fraction you, uh, you suggest for absolute stress EF and drop in EF? So again, I like to see an augmentation in ejection fraction, especially with PET. Now, one thing with SPEC, you have to take care of, keep in mind, if you are doing a one-day protocol, so you're starting with the one study, which could be stress or rest. Most sites start with rest, and then you go to stress. When you go to that, you're injecting triple the dose on the second scan. So at this time, the image quality is appears to be much better on the second scan. And when you have that image quality on the second scan appears to be uh, better, you have better contour delineation and you have better spatial resolution to get a better ejection fraction. So that's why in these patients, I would be very careful on SPECT in terms of uh, the ejection fraction. I want to make sure that it's a true drop in ejection fraction. The other thing in terms of ejection fraction between stress and rest, that most of the time what is happening here is that in SPECT, we image them like an hour, it depends on your protocol, between 30 to 45 minutes, sometimes an hour after. And when you image them that far out, then you may not detect the drop in ejection fraction because the stunning that could have happened at the time of exercise may have completely resolved at this, at this time. So other questions that CFR different between rubidium and ammonia. So I don't wanna jump on the CFR topic, uh, because Dr. DiCarli is going to discuss it in more details for you. Uh, but um, the CFR that we are using, most sites are mostly using, uh, mostly using uh, the um, similar numbers. And in different studies, people have used different cutoffs. Um, so I see a question, can you CFR with SPECT? Yes, it is still mostly done, done for research. It hasn't made it uh, into the clinical arena yet. Dr. DiCarli and Dr. Durbala have been doing it mostly in the Brigham as well as in Ottawa and um, maybe UPMC, but it hasn't made it to the clinical arena still requires some uh, fine tuning before it make it for arena. Um, QC for PET images, I'll reserve that to the cases. We have some images for that. Uh, how would you report a study with normal perfusion but high risk findings? So it depends on the high risk findings, what are they? So for example, if the patient exercise only for three minutes and had a positive EKG, but I don't see perfusion. I would say this is normal perfusion in the setting of low workload. I want to alert the private, the referring physician that this might be a problem with the sensitivity in the study because the patient did not exert that well and we may need to get further testing in there to identify the finding. Now, if the abnormality is only high calcium score, now, this, is, this becomes a different issue because if the abnormality is only cal high calcium score, uh, then it may be uh, less of an issue at the diagnostic level unless you think there is a technical issue. It becomes more of an issue in the prognostic, especially with PET. So with SPEC, you may be prone for, uh, for uh, what do you call it, um, for uh, 
significant balance ischemia, but with PET, with PET, if you look at patients who have normal flow, even in the setting of high calcium, their short-term outcome is predicted primarily by the perfusion results. Their long-term outcome is obviously determined by their high calcium score. And tomorrow you have a long discussion about uh, tomorrow you're going to have a long discussion with, about hybrid imaging, and I'm sure you're going to see more cases with that. Do you see change in location of peak pixel from stress to rest as high risk spec feature? Uh, you need to, there are, this might be a technical issue. It might be better answered at the time of the, uh, the uh, uh, cases, but this is something to keep in mind. Uh, if it is, if you try to normalize for that and there's significant ischemia, then it might be an issue. But in itself, may not be always a, an issue. It might be more technical if the patient moved a little bit or there is some motion sometimes change in pixel. That might be one of the common reasons for that. So floperidas and CFR, I'll defer that to Dr. DeCarli. Yes. And, Yes, no answer, yes. It's still also being worked out. Perfusion defect and lateral wound, normal CFR, image QC twice, how would you interpret? So it depends also if you're using ammonia or rubidium, but uh, if perfusion defect and uh, normal and lateral wall, even with a normal CFR, you're still gonna call it because not every abnormal not every abnormal uh, perfusion defect is going to have an abnormal CFR. There are still some perfusion defects. And good to see you, Fadi. Uh, okay, I know that there is a long question there from George. I'm sorry, I'm not going to... Maybe if you summarize it in one sentence, <laughs> because uh, otherwise we have to take a... Hey, uh, pause here. How you reconcile the Hakomovich data with the ischemia data? So the Hakomovich data with the ischemia data, that's a, there is a, a statement from ASNIC about this, and you probably are refer you to that. But in short summary, ischemia trial looked at different, it's a dis management decision here. We're focusing more on the imaging. Ischemia trial had its own selection criteria and it has its own inclusion and exclusion criteria, which while Hakomovich data is all commerce, so you have different populations, different risk factors, and not everybody in the Hakomovich paper may, up, may be an ischemia candidate in this patient. So I would stop at that point for discussion of the ischemia because it's more of a management decision rather than an imaging a decision. So this will be probably more, I'll leave it for you and your uh, local uh, team about it. Sorry, I was trying answering. Okay. All right. So at this time, it's what time? Let's see. Wow. 1.44. So we're almost moved on. So keep the questions coming. Uh, Carlos is keeping track of them, as well as uh, Sheldon and Usha. And we will just go ahead and uh, start with uh, some cases, I think, to show you uh, some of the patients that we see here. But I thought I'll just like, I liked what uh, Dr. Uh, Miller, Ed Miller, a couple of days ago, gave you a quick introduction about the type of scanners they have in their system. So this is our hospital. We're located in the Texas Medical Center, which is probably the largest medical center per bed in terms of in the world. So there are many other neighboring hospitals and our lab here. And we have, I just want to put in a quick plug-in to many more educational activities for you from our institution on the Baker CV education on both Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Facebook, where you have many lectures by myself, by Dr. Nabi, by Dr. Mamarian, and others. 
so if you follow us on YouTube, you can see many more educational lectures, both nuclear cardiology, cardiac CT, and many other, uh, many other uh, topics in there. So that's the only plugin I have, but our lab is considered, is named under Dr. Mario Virani, who's one of ASNIC founders. And if you go to the ASNIC annual meeting, there is a lecture which is uh, named under Dr. Virani. And uh, it's currently being directed by Dr. Mamerian, who's the, uh, Dr. Mamerian is, past president of ASNIC, and he is also the director of nuclear career, Mario Virani's lab. And uh, in our lab, we have multiple machines. We have SPEC, just simple SPEC machines, and SPEC CT. I'm not gonna go into the details of makes, but for you, it's like from an, some of the cases you're gonna see them are done on SPEC, so we don't have CT attenuation correction for them. Some of them we're gonna have spec CT, so we'll have some CT attenuation correction. And we're lucky to have the newest uh, 3D PET CT digital system. So some of the cases you're gonna see are from this system, which was installed a few months ago. And this is a digital system like from many other vendors allow you to image with higher resolution, higher sensitivity, even with lower doses. So you're gonna see images from SPEC, images from SPEC CT, but it's only a two slice CT, so the CTs may not be the prettiest. And then you're gonna see images from a digital PET system uh, that we have here. So at this time, I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Nabi, who's gonna start to show you some nice cases from our lab here. We open the study and we use uh, for the M software. So you've been seeing some images on the layout, how it looks. So, okay, go ahead. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Moaz, thank you for the opportunity to share some cases with the fellows and everybody else. Uh, anybody have questions, please uh, volunteer. Um, I think for the first case, I will ask my, our own fellow here, Carlos, if he'll help us out with the first case. And uh, Carlos, what, what color scheme do you like to read in? Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, basically, this is a patient who presented with chest pain. Um, I have just about three interesting cases. You know, we'll kind of start straightforward, uh, show some correlation. Uh, as we go along, and um, um, yeah, we'll keep going. So, Carlos, we have the supine stress images on top and uh, the rest images on the bottom. Uh, the short axis followed by the horizontal long and the vertical long axis images. And uh, what do you think of this case? Yes, yeah, so uh, we can see on the first, on the rest images, that there's uh, kind of a decreased counts in the basal, mid, and apical, anterior, lateral, and inferior walls. Uh, moderate decreased, uh, decreased counts. Uh, and then uh, if we look at the stress images, this is further uh, worsened, uh, especially on the basal and mid uh, and apical anterior uh, or ante anterior anterolateral uh, segment with also further decrease in counts and the remaining segments that showed decreased counts at rest as well. Uh, now, in terms of the EID, uh, it's 1.1, so it doesn't meet the cutoffs. And visually, I don't see any enlargement, significant enlargement in the ventricle uh, during stress. All right, Carlos, that was great. Now, I know we spoke a lot about the TID and, you know, what numbers to um, uh, consider as positive and uh, you know I, I sometimes like to read a little bit practical if I were to change this to the grayscale what do you think now comparing just visually comparing the stress uh, cavity to the rest cavity uh, so now uh, looking at the images on this projection on my screen now it doesn't obviously it doesn't seem as 
uh, dramatic, uh, I should say, as the uh, you know the previous color scheme. Now uh, the more the the only segment, if you will, that I can see is the um, basal and mid, maybe an apical uh, ant anterior uh, segment uh, that shows decrease in counts with stress, um, whereas the rest looks uh, looks normal. Okay, yeah, Carlos, um, you're absolutely right. You know, when we, st we sw switch it to the gray and white scale, we start becoming more specific. But I agree with you. I think, you know, there's a large amount of um, um, uh, ischemia in the lateral wall, starting all the way from the basal segments, extending all the way to the apex. Uh, it doesn't completely normalize, so we expect both scar and ischemia there. Uh, what I was trying to show you was, you know, at least in my opinion, if you were to look at the stress images in uh, ISO, I'm, I'm sorry, in um, the, uh, the grayscale, you know, I, you know, I, I believe at least here you can see that the stress image looks larger than the rest cavity. So I think there is an element of uh, transient ischemic dilation, even though the numbers may not have suggested that. And those may very well be the reasons uh, what Moaz was saying based on uh, dose and uh, uh, things like that. So, um, so in this case, of course, uh, we want you to be able to take a look at all of the images. Uh, but right now, I think uh, we're all leaning towards a significant amount of ischemia in the lateral wall, high risk features of uh, transient ischemic dilation. Um, and we'll continue here with the uh, tomographic images. Um, looking, at, Carlos, do you see any abnormal tracer uptake or was it a good quality study? Yeah, it looks like uh, no, no abnormal. Uh, yeah. You can see, and the, the, the motion doesn't seem to be significant motion. Right, no abnormal. And you know the linogram, sinogram show you know that there doesn't seem to be any significant motion, no abnormal uh, radio tracer uptake, uh, looks okay. All right, I'll, let's see if we have. Uh, yeah, okay. Let's move. Okay, decent green. Okay, here we are at now uh, taking a look at the ejection fraction and wall motion. Um, again, you have the stress images on top. The rest. Let me. The best images here. Okay, now we have stress and rest images. Um, you have the uh, ejection fractions there, and what do you think, Carlos? So the ejection fraction uh, was calculated at rest at 58% and 60% with stress. Um, I mean, there is augmentation, but it's not uh, significant augmentation, if, uh, if I can use that. Um, uh, and in terms of the uh, wall motion, sorry, this is kind of stuttering a little bit. Yeah, I think the walls that show decreased uptake seems to be seem to be uh, uh, have wall motion abnormality compared to the other uh, high count areas of the septum. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you, Carlos. Um, you know, at least if you look at the rest images, it seems like if you were to put the cursor right in the middle of the cavity there, it you you appear to have in all directions thickening of uh, the musculature. Um, and, and whereas if you look at this, the stress images, at least I think I, I agree with you, maybe there is a little bit of hypokinesis of that lateral wall. And that would be another high risk finding. And, you know, along with the transient ischemic dilation, this would be con con uh, consistent with, you know, even though the ejection fraction didn't drop uh, necessarily, if we believe technically this was done correctly, um, that this could also represent, you know, some stunning uh, in that lateral wall, another very high risk feature. Um, what would you expect to find uh, on cath? Okay. So 
So if we look here, um, I, I just brought this up. These were the polar maps. You can see exactly as we had been talking about a very large uh, area of, I know our, our color schemes are a little bit different in our lab, but the green being ischemia, a very large area of ischemia here in the uh, lateral wall, the anterior lateral, inferior lateral, extending from the base all the way to the apical segments. And here almost calculated a, about 30% of uh, the musculature. Um, and here is a cath. I, I just brought in still images because, I, you know, uh, but I think everybody will agree with me here. This is a really nice case. You can see the diagonal was occluded in this patient. The ramus was occluded as well as an OM. It looks like they had previous stents over here. So, you know, I, I think now it's very understandable why we had such a large uh, ischemic defect in the lateral wall. So all three territories, all three vessels that normally serve that area are occluded in this case. All right. Go back to the sonograms that I was thinking. Sonogram, yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. There are some questions that are coming out about sinograms and what do they mean to us here. So you can see here, so this is as if you have the heart and you're kind of unfolding it. So when you are unfolding the heart, so you're detecting if there is motion in there. So if there is horizontal motion and if there is motion on the z-axis, it would be very helpful to detect it there. Now, different software will present it in different ways. There are the sinograms, linograms, but the main idea is that it will, these are mainly to make it easier for you to kind of detect motion on these patients if you see them there. And as you see here, we have perfect line here. So this patient did not move at all. And this is a good representation of the images there. All right, thanks, Juan. Okay. Um, yeah, one second, please. Uh, so, our next case uh, also incorporates uh, some high risk features. This will also tie in a little bit into some of the cases that um, um, uh, Dr. Amullah showed us as well. Uh, do we have one of my other fellows um, online? Do we have Rusha there? I'm here. Okay, hi Rusha, how are you? Good, um, how are you? Rusha, take over for us. Uh, take a look at this case. Uh, okay. this was a case. What color, what, what do you like to read in? I like this color. Okay. So here we've got our stress on top, rest in the second row, and we can see that there's a large defect starting a basal anterior, the whole septum going down to the inferior wall, inferoseptum and inferior, extending also to the mid, but again, worse on rest than stress. Let's see what else we have. Do we Rusha, have any other? Yes, Rusha, I'm gonna help you out. You're absolutely right. I, I apologize. Um, I did not give you all the complete information. So here we go. So. Uh, along with other, a lot of other labs in the country, we are also doing a lot of multi-positional imaging. So here, Rusha, I had shown you just previously the supine uh, stress and rest images, but we actually did prone imaging on this patient as well. And um, so okay. here and for, in the, on, for stress. And here, take a look now. Again, it looks worse on rest. Uh, some improvement with prone. Again, I think this is a fixed defect. Where do you see the fixed defect? 
uh, basil, some in the interior, also septum. And inferior, again, better on the prone imaging. Better on the prone imaging. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, very good. Do you see, so uh, now, you know, I, I, I've been trained by Dr. Memory. How much artifact do we have? Any other CP attenuation? V very good questions. Um, we do not have CT attenuation. Okay. On this. So let me just, I'm going to switch over to ISO contour because believe it or not, I'm used okay. to looking at these images. Um, I've been trained by Dr. Mamarian, so I feel comfortable in, in, in this color set. And basically, you know, whatever perfusion abnormalities you were seeing on your supine images, specifically in the basal inferior wall, you can see that that, that has significantly improved when you change the patient's posture. So this would be what we consider moving defects and uh, any defect that you know, is transient from one position to the next is we consider that not to be a true defect. So uh, I uh, concur with you that- We can see it normalized here, yep. Yeah, at least in the basal and mid Im images, you know, all of this defect that we were seeing, and I'll switch that back to isocontra. I know a lot of you all like, uh, are comfortable with that. A lot of this basal in mid inferior wall defect completely normalizes when you change patient's position. This can also be confirmed when you look at the tomographic images um, here where you see, you know, as soon as uh, I'll just stop this, and uh, you can see over here, this is the, the heart in the center of the screen. And as you can see, as we, when we rotate laterally, you can see tremendous amounts of attenuation with the scanner in the basal inferior, inferior infralateral walls. So that would again be consistent with what we're seeing um, and um, that we suspect at least the basal and inferior lateral wall um, are, is attenuation correction. Now then I guess we're left with uh, what you believe about the apical segments. And what did you think about those? I think the apical is probably normal, it's normal. It completely normalizes on the prone imaging. I and I concur with you as well. Um, you know, you you see a defect here in the you know very very tip of the heart. Uh, it seems better with prone imaging. Um, definitely, you may see a little bit here uh, at the true apex, but that you know there is a if we look at the wall motion that will help clarify whether. Um, this is a true defect or whether this could possibly be an artifact. And how do you feel this motion, uh, the motion of the apex is here in the um, apical segments? It looks fine to me. Yeah, so I, I thought so too. So if we have what we, if we consider maybe a mild perfusion defect in the apical segment with normal wall motion, you know, more than likely this is apical thinning artifact. So um, I, I felt very, when I, when I read this study, you know, I felt really comfortable that this was a normal study. Uh, did you see anything that you would disagree with me, Rusha? No, it looks fine here. Okay. Well, we, you know, uh, the audience, uh, you know, we were not here to present you normal cases. So what was about this case that um, would give us you know, what, what made it uh, where we were concerned about this patient. So I'm going to switch over to my PowerPoint slide. All right. And so this is just uh, the slides we had discussed. You know, ejection fraction you can see at rest and uh, post-stress where, uh, you know, function remained normal. Um, oh, sorry. Okay. okay, so these were our same images here. We were talking about 
you can see the ejection fraction was preserved in both the stress and rest images. When you looked at the polar maps, whether you compared the, um, the supine with the normal database or the prone with the normal database, there was a very, very small defect on, with the um, supine images and a completely normal study with the prone images. However, um, the story didn't end there. This patient actually exercised for us and have a look at the, the CKG. Rusha, what do you think? You can see your VT. Yeah, I mean, that in, in this particular case, you know, the patient at rest had a wide QRS and then run right bundle branch morphology. And just probably because I can see the screen a whole lot better, there are okay. P waves here that are marching with the QRS. This patient was, you know, going pretty fast. He was going at about 150 beats per minute. Uh, this was sinus, but you can appreciate oh. here tremendous amounts of ST depressions, um, both in the lateral leads as well as in 2, 3, and ABF. So this was a, this gentleman was, and you know, he, and surprisingly, he was able to exercise nine minutes. He did get his heart rate up to 91% of maximum blood pressure augmented as it should, but he did complain of chest pain. And this is where it becomes very important when we're interpreting studies that, uh, yes, a, a, a perfusion is a very sensitive technique, but we really have to take into account all the different variables of a stress test. And, and Moaz was very particular in emphasizing that. So here, you know, we really do have a discrepancy possibly between the perfusion images and how this patient feels when they exercise and definitely evidence of an ischemic EKG. So based upon this, um, in our report, uh, I know there was a question about that. We placed, you know, there is a discrepancy. We recommend further imaging. Um, so or, or for, yeah, I no, I felt 80, you know, 80 milliseconds from the J point. I think we're still well below the, uh, the, the um, what is it called? The P, PQ segment. So I felt these were true ST segment depressions. Um, and yeah, and, and as to the first part of the question, well, well, it can be very, very hard. <laughs> now you can maybe see calcium if it's very dense, but I wouldn't go about it. Calcium score is from the other location. We don't do calcium score on the scalp. We do calcium scores on the regular CT, so it's a separate acquisition. You have to have a good CT system to be able to acquire it while the patient is doing better. You have specific parameters. It's not done on the camera alone. You have to have a CT. So now going back to this case, you know, where we have the discrepancy between perfusion and our exercise variables, further testing was recommended. This is also, I think, very important as physicians who will be re, uh, obtaining these results, you also have to put, you know, whatever results come out from your lab in perspective to your patient. So if you have a patient whose perfusion results are normal, but you, you look at the report and it says EKGs dropped and they were having chest pain, and you remember from your hospital visit or your outpatient clinic visit that, you know, their symptoms were very typical, you know, I would not stop there. And so, you know, here is this patient. This patient actually, the physician um, likes to get uh, calcium scores with all his normal uh, spec studies. And you can see there was tremendous amount of evidence for atherosclerosis present with a coronary artery calcium score of um, 1,816. Again, a completely separate technique, uh, a, a way of imaging uh, than a simple scalp. Um, and from this, uh, you know, uh, I think we have now demonstrable evidence that this patient definitely has severe atherosclerosis. Uh, this patient did go on to the cath lab because they were symptomatic. And you can see here, uh, this patient had, um, you know, uh, what was mentioned by one of our other fellows, um, balanced ischemia 
with evidence of significant um, three vessel coronary artery disease. Um, uh, I think we're getting a lot of questions about PET calcium score and CFR. So why don't we just go and show you a case of PET with calcium score, where PET may be able to add more information there. The um, patient in his 60s who has been having knee osteoarthritis. So he's kind of limited in his exercise and he was being evaluated for a total knee replacement. So this patient, they wanted to do an assessment of his um, uh, preoperative risk, and because he could not exercise because of his knee osteoarthritis, his referring physician alluded, uh, elected to go ahead and do a uh, <coughs> calcium score. So we knew ahead of time that his calcium score came back to be 1900. So this is a patient that who had a calcium score of 1900. He's going, he need preoperative evaluation. He's asymptomatic at this time. And the question that comes here is, how are we going to assess this patient? And to be able to see your responses, give me one second. I had this, uh, but stress at this time. Uh, so he was actually referred for, for a cardiac CT. But we thought that cardiac CT may not be the appropriate test in this patient because he has a very high calcium score. Reading it may be a challenge because of all the calcification. And we went ahead and switched the patient to be a uh, cardiac PET. So these are his perfusion images. And I'm looking at the chat box on another computer. So tell me, what do you think of these images? So do you think, I'll give you a few seconds to look at them look normal, abnormal. So I know before this patient made it to the lab that he has a high calcium score. So I'm seeing normal, normal. Okay, so as I showed you in my lecture, with PET, we have actually multiple parameters that we can look at and be able to look, make sure that we're not, uh, missing balanced ischemia or major disease in these patients, and this is not a high-risk feature. So let's look at the ejection fraction. And this is his ejection fraction. It's probably gonna take a few moments until you see the full contraction on your monitors. But you can see the loops, and if they're not playing well on your monitor, depending on your internet, speed, but how, what do you think of the ejection fraction? For those of you who is unable to see it, it went up from 61 to 65 percent. Another normal, his EKG was normal too. And now we're, we didn't repeat obviously the calcium score at this time and people wanted to ask about this patient perfusion data. So the first thing here, we have the dynamic imaging. So for those of you who don't do PET, we're doing my cardiac blood flow assessment at stress and at rest. We wanna put our contours to make sure that we're getting it in the right position. And we can check for motion here. So we are seeing that this patient was relatively fair, did not move much. And now I'm gonna show you the CFR data. And what you see here is that his resting flow was about 0.6 and his peak flow was two and his CFR is 3.22. And if I put in my normal database, this is rubidium.
tells me that it is 100% normal there. So how are we going to reconcile all this information for the referring physician? And the question that I received literally from the referring physician, how sure that this patient does not have obstructive disease? So everything on the PET is perfectly normal. I mean, his numbers by CFR are normal. His study quality is good. And you have a uh, good quality study, well attenuated, I mean, well attenuation corrected. So the patient, was the patient an athlete? No, the patient is not an athlete because as I told you, he's going for a knee replacement, so he's barely moving. So, and this is the point where we tell the referring physician, I think it is adding a significant information now. We have perfusion imaging, we have the calcium score, and we are pretty sure when you have this type of information, the CFR, which is in the threes, you have good ejection for a good uh, flow, now I'm pretty sure and confident that I'm not missing obstructive disease. And you have a perfectly normal perfusion with no deficit in there. And this patient, we told him that he has high atherosclerosis. So long term from the MESA data, we know that these patients with a calcium score of more than 2000, they're gonna have higher event rate compared to others. But from, the short term, can he go for the surgery? Does he have obstructive disease that will prevent him from going to the surgery? I don't think so. And so no flow limiting, short term prognosis is good, but long term prognosis, this is not a patient that you tell him keep doing what you're doing. You need good blood pressure control, you need to put him on aspirin, high dose statin. So this is quote unquote 1.5 prevention. It's not primary prevention, it's not, really secondary prevention is 1.5 prevention, and this is where no need for further uh, testing, and the patient had the surgery, did fine, and as we predicted. So this is where we put all the aspects together and to guide our referring physicians when we're looking at this. So I am going to show you another case Again, I'm monitoring, we're having the uh, chat box. So anyone has any question about what you're seeing here, please chat it and. All right, so this is another patient. She is a 64 year old female. Uh, multiple risk factors, hypertension, uh, metabolic syndrome, uh, she is of Indian origin, so she has a lipid profile. Uh, she has low HDL and uh, high LDL kind of type of uh, profile. And this lady was actually uh, visiting her son in California and she is coming back in the plane. She started to develop chest pain. So they the pain was for her significant enough that, and headache, that they took her kind of directly from the plane about to the emergency room where she was evaluated there, negative EKG, negative troponin. Blood pressure was a little bit up at that time, so they managed her at that, over there. And then they sent her to us uh, like a few days later after being discharged from the emergency room with negative evaluation. So we did the my pet myocardial perfusion imaging this lady, and these are the images. So I'm going to ask you now, I'm not gonna pick on anyone in specific, going to ask you, tell me what do you think of these images? Anyone want to read them? Just say what you see there. So CERC OM disease, three vessel disease, keep them coming, anterolateral ischemia, perfusion in lateral wall, perfu anterior anterolateral, entire anterolateral, perfusion defect in the apricot. Okay, keep them coming. 
I want to see TID. What else? Visual TID and the relateral. Okay. So this is, anyone can remember? So this is a PET scan. So this is Rubidium PET. Okay. What else you think? RV enlargement. Okay. Well, I don't think you can comment on the RV because you don't see it all. I know that you were hearing from other comments about like, if you really want to see the RV, you should like try to zoom out to be able to see the RV. And honestly, I'm someone who is pretty skeptical about the RV. I only call it when I see it. I mean, here, so here, not that impressive, but okay, stress, high risk pet stress. Okay, so we should take her to the cat lab. So anyone want to tell me what could, this could be? TID big time, gut artifact. So somebody is saying gut artifact. Okay, so what is this? Actually, this is a good point that someone is pointing out. What is this? Dr. Durbara kind of mentioned this a couple of days ago, a little bit. So what, this is the spleen. Okay, someone just answered, good. So what do you see between the difference between the spleen, between stress and rest? So stress on top, rest on the bottom. What do you see? So anyone has any comment? So decreased perfusion. This is what we call splenic switch off. So technically, you have less blood to the flow to the spleen. And that has been suggested in both the MRI literature and the PET literature that this could be a sign that your vasodilator is working. So if you zoom out and you see the spleen and you see more count on rest, less count on stress, so you know that your test is working and this lady doesn't have a lot of perfusion and this is called splenic switch off as i said on mri and on uh, ct sorry on pet you can see it and you can determine that so let's go back to the a little bit more zoomed images to be able to see the perfusion defect right so not that much though okay so this is a little bit more zoomed now so what's the problem with this study? Let's look at the function. So now I'm looking at function and the ejection fraction really went up from 66 to 71%. So this is looking good. I'm going to the calcium score of this patient. And now I'm coming down, let me see. Yeah, so I'm looking at calcium score. Yeah, I, I kind of persuaded you or because I, this patient actually has zero calcium score. I mean, zero calcium score, but this much ischemia. I mean, yes, you can have obstructive disease in patients with zero calcium score, but this is not a common finding. You'd better be, okay, so finally it came. Somebody is saying truncation of the breast. Well, that's a CT part, so that's a reconstruction because we're reconstructing here for the calcium score. This is not really truncation. That's just focusing on the, on the uh, calcium score. But what you see here is that I'm looking at this and now I'm like, could this be an artifact? Because remember that we always do PET CT. So we are doing PET and a CT and then fusing these images. So now I have the CT attenuation correction and I have the PET data. And now I'm gonna go up and show you where is the heart is moving there. So, and again, here you can see that the whole lateral wall, I'm sorry, my mouse is moving quickly. Give me one second to zoom it up so you can see it very well. So you can see here that on this one, there is a nice lateral wall defect. 
because the lateral wall is where the lung should be. This is not where the lateral wall is. And ideally, this should be like this. This should be, the heart should be here. And this is misregistration artifact. And this is something you need to, to be careful about when reading these scans, because otherwise, you'll be calling misregistration artifacts into the lateral. And the most typical one is actually the lateral, is the anterior lateral one. So when we go, okay, so now that I fixed it, these are the true images of this patient. And you can see this is not magic, this is just misregistration. And misregistration is not specific to PET. This can be seen in PET, this can be seen in SPECT. So every time you have two modalities, SPECT and PET, sorry, SPECT and CT, PET and CT, you need to make sure that the heart is where it should be, and this is what we need to look at. So it's very important to make sure that we don't induce the defects. Otherwise, the most sensitive test, which has been shown to be PET, is gonna become a lot of artifacts, and then these patients may not be having good accurate results. So any question about this? I see a lot of comments. Stenic switch off is noted in diperidam wall and but not reported with rigadenosan. That's absolutely correct, but we are seeing it with rigadenosan. So again, it's mostly with uh, diperidam wall, but we can see it also with rigadenosan. I think some of the MRI case studies are uh, in, uh, uh, what do you call it, in uh, rigadenosan. Why is it only in stress? Well, it just happened that the artifact happened in stress. Uh, that either the patient moved or the tech who was processing it uh, uh, technically caused it. And uh, to all full due credit to my techs, I mean, this is something I created, misregistration primarily for educational purposes. So the techs did it right and they do a good job, but this is something they check every case and do. But I created the misregistration for you because I couldn't find the real one, simply because I wanted to show this point and document the point. Our techs are doing a great job with that. All right. Okay, so I think at this time, I'm gonna give it to my uh, fellow Dr. Carlos and then we'll follow up with Dr. Shad and Caliph to uh, tell you about a, an interesting case that he saw while I'm prepping the images. So go ahead, Carlos. So yeah, hi everyone. This is uh, the his, a, a, a um, case of a 65 years old male patient. He presented to us actually with a one week history of intermittent palpitations, shortness of breath, uh, some lightheadedness. Uh, there was no chest pain or an, no syncope uh, in his history. Uh, his past medical history was significant for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and the history of heart block uh, status post a CRTD. Also, he has uh, atrial fibrillation and uh, hypertension. Uh, when we saw him, on his physical exam was actually um, non-pertinent. Uh, uh, vitals were normal. Uh, his cardiovascular exam and lung exam um, was uh, not significant. Uh, his labs were uh, also mostly within normal, except for the creatinine, which is which was about uh, 1.5. Uh, okay, so the EKG, as you can see it now, uh, he has a paced uh, rhythm with wide uh, QRS, regular, with underlying atrial fibrillation. Yeah, so so this is uh, this is later actually. This is. Uh, so after he presented, the first thing that was done, uh, since again, his history was 
lightheadedness uh, and some intermittent palpitations. And since you have a CRPD, uh, that was interrogated. And uh, as you can see on the screen, he had uh, runs of, uh, of VTAC. So the first, the first imaging that was done, obviously, uh, in such a scenario, uh, was echo. And here we put an image of a TEE since it showed, happened to show in a good quality the RV and LV. And you see this biventricular systolic dysfunction. Obviously, after that, the cath was done, uh, you know, to roll out ischemic cardiomyopathy and it was completely normal. So the next step we did was a uh, cardiac MRI. Uh, as you can see on the images, uh, these are, uh, you can, you know, this is with a CRT, remember. So the image quality is, it might, may look a bit fuzzy, but this is with a CRT, so it's relatively very good. More importantly, on the right side, uh, yeah, so Dr. Al-Mallah wants me to kind of quiz, and I'm looking at the chat box as to uh, what do you see on the right side, uh, the right-sided set of images. So, uh, someone is asking why TE? No, we, we did a TTE, but again, we I just put this TE image because it showed the best uh, kind of... Uh, uh, representation of his ventricular function. Yeah, so uh, there's a, a comment saying subendocardial LGE, which is which is true, uh, and some already are mentioning already a diagnosis. Um, yes, I mean there's substantial uh, late gadolinium enhancement, mostly subendocardial, involving the basal to the apical segments of the LV. Um, sometimes involving up to 50% of the wall of the ventricle. And it was calculated actually to be about 41% of the, the, the LV scar size. Uh, so for the fellows, what do you think is the differential for this one? What could you call this one? I know it's diffuse subendocardial and let's look at the potential. So. I'm having people asking about the eosinophils. Uh, at that time, there were normal amyloid. Okay, that's a good thought. Amyloid, amyloid, TTR, amyloid. Keep them coming. All right, chagas. Unfortunately, we don't see that many chagas here. Myocarditis. Yeah, it's like could be a myocarditic. So this is what the group here wanted to do. And uh, we wanted to go ahead and make sure that we cover the bases with this patient. So amyloid was put in high in the differential. And we wanted to go ahead and look at whether there is truly amyloid. And this patient initially had a PYP scan. I know Dr. Durbala, who's the expert on this, and she's going to show us show you like a lot of an amyloid data, but I want to show you here some of the amyloid images. Okay, so who thinks that this is positive just by looking at it? I know I'm not gonna go into the details how we grade some PYP, so positive PYP, excellent. Okay, what else? So why positive? Because we have increased cardiac uptake and it is, Technically, I would say close to, and this view, it may be even like more than the bone. So grade three, and if we want to draw the ROI, so again, Dr. Durbala is going to cover this in more details, uh, I think next week, but you can see here, we can draw, sorry, we can draw the ROI. And here we are getting, I think 60 something, and here, we do the contralateral lung. So anyway, when we did this, at the time of the study, it was coming to 1.5. So planar images, clearly uptake, and then this question was maybe amyloid. Well, the patient went for biopsy, it turned out to be not amyloid. There was just nonspecific scarring. So what could it be? And let's see. Got the 250,000 ready for first year of Tefemidus. Okay. Wow, people are pretty impressive. Should you start him on Tefemidus? 
before the biopsy. Well, the biopsy came back negative. And obviously you need to get the kappa lambda, which were negative too. So what do you think is going on? AL, SPEP, half pep, uh, FLC, all negative. Hydrotoxicity, no, is not on that medication. Mild liver uptake, yes, I agree with that. Okay, sarcoid, okay, well, the biopsy came back negative, and I'm gonna go back here to the MRI to show you. I mean, could this be something else? I mean, we're looking at it again, and could this be a sarcoid? I mean, when it is as burned out from myocarditis with low ejection fraction, I mean, technically it could potentially go with anyone. However, in my at least humble way, when I read this is that, if you can suppress some myocardium, then you're not gonna be able, usually in amyloid, the entire LV you cannot suppress here. There are some segments that we are able to null, and this is probably not amyloid, this is probably something else. So the patient was referred for us to potentially look for inflammatory cardiomyopathy. Obviously we cannot tell if this patient is sarcoid or any other um, cardiomyopathy, but to make a long story short, we're gonna open the study and we'll show you the results. So this patient actually, uh, went for initially the cardiac uh, sarcoid, and you've seen some sarcoid cases from Dr. Miller. I gave you a lecture, so we did prepare them, we did rest perfusion, and then we followed it up with FTG, and these are the images. So these are the images, and anyone can say something. Histocytosis, there is a rat bite appearance. What's a rat bite appearance? No rat bite up here. All right, so what do you think? Let me see your responses. Fabris, hemochromatosis. Um, I'm not sure I know how hemochromatosis would look here. I mean, it could be if there is local inflammation. So there is active inflammation. So what you see here is this perfusion defect in the multiple areas, and they are in agreement with the MRI. And uh, you can see that there is almost a mirror image, right? I mean, here the septum as if you cut it off and now you get it completed on the MRI. I like to look at this now more frequently with the black and white, at least the MRI, the FTG images, because they give you better sensitivity. So now you appreciate this more, you appreciate this, you can see the perfusion defect, can see the RV and on black and white somehow I find it. So biopsy without a granuloma. Yes, the patient had the cardiac biopsy. There was just diffuse fibrosis. But you can see this guy was telling me when I first met him, like there were days he got 16 shocks from his ICD. And that's why we kept fishing and looking for this. Now, Dr. Miller also told you that we can, we can look at the fusion and get SUVs. I'm not gonna go through these details, but if I show you the PET, there are a few things that you usually don't get on these regular studies. And here, let me just try to zoom it so you can see it better. So you can see these here, these were very hot. And if I come down, I see it more. You can see also this patient, many of his shocks were inappropriate because of atrial arrhythmias. And you can see the FTG uptake in the left atrium in this patient. And you can see here that this patient actually had significant scarring that, sorry, inflammation, not scarring, inflammation that we see in the left atrium and the right in the ventricle and otherwise. So this is a case that clearly shows, and his SUVs were pretty hot in the sixes and sevens. So multiple areas of perfusion defects and multiple areas of FTG uptake. Any question here? Why PYP was positive? Good question. We're gonna come back to that. Now this patient actually, 
this study was done in August, and this patient actually, we put him on therapy as our protocol, and we have, we're lucky to have a good uh, heart failure team who go ahead and have good uh, assessment of these patients. They follow them up, they put them on uh, steroid, and now we follow them up, and this is just like after six months. So what do you think, improved or no, not improved? Let me see. So in the perfusion defect, if you remember, it improved here. There was a large perfusion defect there. And here, if you're looking at, at just some images, they appear to be that they are actually uh, the same. But when we measure SUVs, SUVs dropped by half. So sometimes the fixed images, as Ed Miller was mentioning, the uh, relative images may not be that accurate. But if you go ahead and do the relative, the absolute numbers of SUVs, this is where you see that this patient really improved. And you can see here that his uh, myocardium actually had less perfusion defect. His ejection fraction went up by 10%. And actually, the patient <clears throat> was having less shocks in there. However, if you look again, keep it a habit on these sarcoid cases, you need to look at the inflammation. And what you see here, so let's go back. Remember the left atrial, uh, the left atrial uh, increased uptake there. So let me zoom in. Yeah, so where is that left atrial uptake? Remember all that left atrial uptake that was there? It's not there anymore. It's all gone. So at least on high dose steroids. But what do you see now? You see more, more uptake in the lung. Look at it here. See where my mouse is. So as I go up and down. So you can see the lymph nodes, you can see the lung uptake itself, there is another spot there. So this patient is most likely to be truly sarcoid because now, so yes, we improved his cardiac situation, but his lung and extra cardiac really significantly come down. Now, why was the biopsy negative? Because most likely they didn't biopsy an area of inflammation or an area that had already been scarred. So I left the PYP open, and I know that there is a question, why is the PYP negative? Why do you think it's that? I remember the e patient, what was his ejection fraction? Anyone can put it in there. So somebody just answered why we think it is. Because his EF was 27, sorry, 17% at the time of this one. So if you just go on planar, you don't know. I mean, this patient, so when we go ahead, we do SPECT on all our patients. So I'm gonna show you a SPECT. This patient has blood pool. All this cavity, all this PYP is in the left ventricle. You see it in the left ventricle. Obviously, it's not like I cannot localize it without a CT very well. But you can see this patient has a PYP because it's got blood pooling. All the PYP was in the ventricle, not in the myocardium. This is why this patient, actually his PYP was positive. And that's why Dr. Durbala is probably gonna allude more into this. But you need to keep in mind these cases that have positive PYP and low ejection fraction. You wanna make sure that this is not blood pooling. 64 year old female that um, presented to our hospital with acute onset heart failure with a decline in her functional capacity. Um, she was previously relatively okay, had a background history of controlled lupus, mitral valve repair years back, um, and perioperatively developed sick sinus syndrome requiring a pacing. Um, Within a six-month period of time, she had repeat admissions for heart failure exacerbation, a total of four admissions with a decline in her ejection fraction to 25%. 
um, despite being on maximally tolerated heart failure regimen. Of, as part of the workup that she underwent, she had normal cardi uh, coronary angio. There was no CAD in the history. Um, however, um, her echocardiogram did point out that there was dilatation. There was moderate eccentric hypertrophy that led the heart failure team to want to investigate for other infiltrative cardiomyopathies. Um, the question of amyloid had been brought up by the team. Um, laboratory evaluation was not consistent with AL, but um, there was question whether this could be TTR amyloid in this patient. So a PYP scan was obtained, um, and we're looking at the images as we speak. At the time of the study, the heart to contralateral lung ratio came out to be about 1.5, so that's in the equivocal range for TTR amyloid. Um, that led to more questions. Okay, yes, so Dr. what did you do there? Anyone want to shout out like or go type in the text comment in the text chat box? What do you think is going on? Okay, heart to contralateral, yes, it's 1.5. So now after I showed you the prior case, everybody wanna look at the SPECT images. And what do you think in there? Unfortunately, I cannot show them very well, but I'll try to zoom out as much as I can. So blood pool, that's a potentially good thought, but doesn't look like it very well. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Shannon. So the 1.5 ratio spec is not very helpful in terms of imaging. So, so at what this are we point, going the question, to? yep. The question was, what would you, we do next in this case? So the decision was uh, to pursue a cardiac MRI on this patient to further um, characterize or understand what's going on. Um, I think those images play Dr. Elmala, if you can play them. Right. Okay. So as we can see, there's a dilated biventricular cardiomyopathy here, um, the LVEF on CMR came out to be about 47% and an RVEF came to be at 35%. Okay, so for the sake of time, I'm just gonna go directly to the late gadolinium enhancement yep. images. So okay. on these LGE images, we do see dense scarring throughout the, myo uh, the septal areas. Um, that's very dense fibrosis throughout that septal region as we go through, as well as some delayed enhancement of the RV free wall, the lateral aspect. Yep, on that image. And okay. there are areas in the anterolateral wall, so multiple areas of delayed enhancement. We use the various uh, newer sequence here, the fiddle sequence, and that really um, showed pretty dense scarring along with biatrial enhancement, um, both right and left atrial walls. So um, anyone, if anybody has any... Anyone shout out with the diagnosis? So I'm here seeing sarcoid and marine the septum. Uh, sarcoid, it's a good thought, although I haven't seen sarcoid really giving this much dense scar in the septum. It's usually yeah. more patchy kind of. Yeah. Okay. So, correct. Um, somebody had asked wh whether or not the AV block came ahead. The AV block was way before at the time. It was perioperatively like 10 years back, so that wasn't any acute processes, and there was no v VT on interrogation of the device or whatnot. Um, so I'm seeing some good answers come in the uh, discussion. So 
So she went for a biopsy, and the biopsy was negative for amyloid, myocarditis, and sarcoid. However, there were vacuoles on pathology within the um, cells obtained, which raised the question of whether or not this is truly um, chloroquine toxicity or um, hydrochloroquine toxicity. So um, the patient was... Right now, especially in the current COVID era, so, and all the publicity, these medications are coming. So if you start to see some patients coming in with restrictive cardiomyopathy, and they've been secretly taking this medication to protect them from hydroxy, from COVID, this is something to think of. I suspect we're gonna see some of these cases in the coming few weeks. Yeah, so not a benign drug, lots of problems from our end, QT prolongation, as we know, advanced AV block, fatal cardiomyopathies, including ones like this that we see. Hopefully, um, in this patient, we were able to stop the medication and um, she was treated with pulse dose steroids and uh, she had really good recovery of her EF. All right, so Shannon, there is a question, is this dependent on the cumulative dose or your patients can get it from? Correct, so who's at risk is usually older patients, patients on long-term therapy and um, the elevated per kilogram dose. Um, if there is any other cardiac underlying pathologies, it puts the patient for um, higher risk to develop this type of toxicity along with renal insufficiencies. Okay, any question from the group? It's usually subacute. Usually it's subacute, I'm assuming, but again, I'm not the expert on this. I think this is something to keep in mind if someone like was taking this medication for COVID and potentially have developed this sign of symptom. So we actually prepared way more cases. We could only get through maybe 10% of cases or so. You can see all these cases been prepared, but I see the time is 2.57 and we have to be cognizant on the cognizant time. So if there are any questions, please type them in the chat box. Otherwise, I'll hand it back to Shalmira. Moaz, thank you very much to you and your entire team actually for a terrific session. Uh, really amazing cases, very clear presentation and discussion. And as you can see, we have over 250 folks still on the line joining us. So thanks to all of you for staying on for today. Uh, be sure to join us tomorrow to hear from Dr. Randy Thompson about hybrid imaging, spec CT, and PET CT. So with that, we take leave. Thank you very much. Good evening.